Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Isabel, and this is my colleague Bo, and we work in the fine tuner or the embedding tuning team at Gina AI. And so what we do is um, do a lot of research and implementation of new architectures and training tricks, and finally we get to publish really good embedding models, and that's exactly what I'll talk to you about today. So I'll talk mostly about Gina Embeddings V2, our second version of embedding models, and um, more specifically, a German-English bilingual model, and then also um, how we can apply this in a hybrid search context. So a quick overview of what I'll talk about. Um, quick introduction to embedding models, just in case there is someone who hasn't heard of them. Maybe we can get a quick show of hands if anyone, well, let's say uh, anyone who's heard of embedding models before. Good, okay, <laughs> that's everyone. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep this very short then. Um, yeah, then I'll jump into an overview of how we train these embedding models. So the training process, the data preparation, and of course, we all like to see numbers. So I'll cover some evaluations and metrics that we use to yeah, pr uh, see how good our model is. And finally, I'll also show a quick hybrid search demo with a bilingual embedding model. And then Bo Wang will also talk about uh, our technical reports that we publish. So quick um, overview of what are, what are embeddings. So um, instead of a large language model that produces or generates text, embedding models generate a vector representation of your input. And so in this case, the input is a text input. I love fluffy cats. And um, ideally, if your embedding model is any good, it can capture important semantic information in the input text and have that as part of the ve vector representation. And of course, you know that um, these vectors don't mean much to people. Um, you can't really point to any particular index in this list of numbers and say that it represents a particular feature. But what you can do is uh, make sense of these vectors in the latent space. And so documents that have a similar semantic should hopefully be located in a similar sp uh, subspace within your vector space. And yeah, so these vectors should be mathematically similar as well, and you might use something like cosine similarity to compare the texts to one another. Of course, this is really useful for downstream tasks like semantic search. So you encode your query and you compare it to your encoded data set and you can return um, some similar documents. Or you might want to use it for clustering. So on an unlabeled um, set of data, you might be able to find centroids that neatly um, yeah, represent some subspace within your data. So what are our objectives for training embedding models? Well, first of all, we wanted to train embedding models that are good on a variety of different downstream tasks. And of course, we use the MTB benchmark for this that has um, tasks ranging from retrieval to classification, clustering, um, semantic textual similarity. And so we always uh, check against this benchmark to see how good our model is in general. Um, secondly, at the time when we first started training embedding models, it was also really important for us to allow input sequence lengths that go beyond 8,000, or at least beyond uh, 512, which was the standard at the time. So all BERT-based models would have this kind of cap at 512 tokens. And I'll talk a bit later about how we achieved this. Um, of course, as mentioned in our title as well, um, we decided to train bilingual embedding models. And so the idea was to make the model really shine in two different languages, as opposed to maybe doing mediocre across the various different languages. But more recently, for our V3 model, we do aim to make this model multilingual and cover up to 100 different languages. And very recently, so just this last week, we released our first multimodal model, which is Gina Clip. And my colleague will talk about that a bit later as well. Um, yeah, last but not least, we are also an um, open source company at heart. And so we not only publish our models on Hugging Face, which you can download and use freely as you like, but we also routinely publish um, technical reports that go together with these models, where we detail uh, the, yeah, the training process, um, different open source data sets that we use for this, and uh, data pre-processing steps. Cool, so I'll jump straight into the training process for 
um, our embedding models, which starts off, of course, with training Gina BERT, um, or this BERT-based model. And for this, we, of course, take a huge collection of text corpora from the web. Um, we use a mass language modeling strategy, which you probably know of if you know anything about BERT. Um, this is nothing new. We just mask 30% of the tokens in the input and then replace um, of that 80% with a mask, 10% stays unchanged, and then 10% are actually just replaced with a random token. Um, yeah, so why did we train BERT? Why didn't we just use uh, BERT that already exists? So like I mentioned, the original BERT implementation is such that um, it can only really take 512 tokens. And in this graphic, you can see that quite nicely. So if you go beyond 512 tokens, um, the perplexity skyrockets. And so the model really can't handle much beyond that. Whereas if you look at this blue line, which is um, the alibi implementation, you can see that the perplexity is basically stable. And so what the alibi um, algorithm or change does is it removes the positional, positional encode, um, encoding of the model and then replaces that with a relative bias or a linear bias. And this is from the paper uh, Train Short, Test Long, with the idea that you can train on short texts and still do your inference on long texts. And of course, that's really useful because uh, training on really long texts is really expensive, it takes a lot of computational power. So, um, yeah, Alibi can maintain language modeling perplexity uh, when inferencing on sequences that are much longer than what you've trained on. So what kind of corpora do we use for this? Um, well, we take the Common Crawl, Wikipedia, and Orpus, um, because this has Europe, uh, Europol proceedings text in it, which we needed for our bilingual models, of course. Uh, then we apply some rule-based filters, which includes um, yeah, re removing documents that are nonsensical or have some HTML code in them or just have duplicate words all over the place. And then we also apply a deduplication where we basically create a hash for the document and see if it's repeating somewhere in the, in the corpus. And of course, there's tons of repetition across the internet, so this step is really important. And so what we get out at the end are about four to 500 million text documents, and we have about half of them in English, and then half of them in German, or the target language for the bilingual model. So the next stage is the pairwise training, where we use a bi-encoder architecture. And um, during this training, of course, we get two text pairs, um, sentence A and sentence B in this case, that are somehow semantically similar. They belong to each other. And we try to maximize this, uh, the representations of both texts within the model such that the cosine similarity between these two texts um, is very high. Uh, what, where do we get the data for this? Um, we take um, yeah, naturally occurring pairs, for example, titles and paragraphs, questions and answers, instructions, and uh, responses for these instructions. And yeah, we basically just mine these kind of pairs. Um, and these pairs have the same pre-processing steps as the raw data that I mentioned previously. But we also apply an extra step, which is consistency filtering. So we try to make sure that these pairs actually do belong to together. So what does the consistency filtering look like? We create um, an index of about um, one million embeddings from the right side of the pairs. So those are all the descriptions or answers or responses. And then we encode all of the pairs into two embeddings. And we retrieve, well, first, first we determine the similarity of that pair, and then we retrieve the second highest um, similarity or the second highest document from the index. And we compare um, the similarity of this retrieved um, right side to the anchor or the question and see if that similarity is higher or lower than the original pair. And if it is higher, then, well, probably this pair is garbage and we discard it. So, yeah, that is the consistency filtering step. What does the training objective look like during prioritized training? Um, so we have some data sources. We store them in S3. We construct a batch of pairs, so 
question one, pair one, and so forth, until you fill up the batch. And then this is what we, how we calculate the loss. So of course, we maximize the similarity between a query and a positive, and then we minimize the similarity between the query and all other positives in that batch. Um, formulas, scary, but necessary. <laughs> So, um, yeah, in this case, we're taking all the questions, comparing to them to the, the positives, and minimizing the similarity of the question to the positive, so, sorry, maximizing it, and minimizing the query and the positives of all other questions in the batch. But we can do that the other way around too. So we can use the answer for a particular question and maximize its similarity, and then um, minimize the similarity between the answer and all other questions in that batch. So we call this, or it's called in general, um, bidirectional inference CE. So next comes the hard negative or triplet training, which is kind of similar to the pairwise training, except that we add a hard negative component. And this hard negative isn't just like in the previous step where you consider all other items in the batch as negatives, but these are actually mined hard negatives and they should be really hard. Um, so here's an example. London is a city in which Canadian province? Well, the positive would be Ontario, because that's just the correct answer. But we can also have some negatives. So Quebec, Nova Scotia, Manitoba, and so forth. And these are, of course, semantically related to the query, um, because they're all Canadian provinces. But maybe an easy negative would be England, because it's not a Canadian province at all. It's just um, potentially a country where London is a city in. Um, yeah, so that gives you an idea of what these look like. Um, also, importantly to notice here is that we have multiple negatives that the model sees at once, um, which are hard negatives. <clears throat> so how do we um, make sure that these are actually properly hard negatives? Uh, we first construct an index with all of the embeddings for all the answers in a data set. And then uh, we can take the top k nearest neighbors for each query as hard neg possible hard negatives. But then we can filter out these false negatives um, using a cross encoder model by seeing whether um, the, the similarity between the query is high enough, so higher than a certain s uh, threshold that we set. And if it's close enough to the query but not annotated as a positive, then surely it must be a negative. So that's the assumption here. And so we construct tuples like query, positive, negative, and yeah, many negatives up to M. For our training, we usually use seven of these hard negatives. And to show you some more formulas, because <laughs> they're part of machine learning, um, this is the component that is added here to the, to the loss. And so we try to um, uh, minimize the similarity between the query and all negatives um, for that query. As for the data distribution for the bilingual model, so I already mentioned um, for the BERT training, we have about 50% English, 50% of the other language, for example, German. And for the pairwise training, we have about 66% English, 30% um, of the other language um, in the training data, and then a little bit of parallel data but it's really hard to uh, come by, so we take what we can get. And then for the full embedding training, we have 30% um, English, so reversed, 65% um, of translated triplets, so they're translated because um, the previous mining step for all the English data produces really good triplets, and we just translate those into the target language. Um, and then we have some, a little bit of um, triplets for the additional language, about 3% that is existing. And yeah, so as part of the suite of embedding models, we've um, published four so far. So this first one is the English um, monolingual embedding model. The second one is the German English bilingual model, then a Chinese English bilingual model, and lastly, the Spanish English bilingual model. And these are, of course, all um, free to use on Hacking Face, so you should totally have a look if you want. And now for some results. So I mentioned for the bilingual model, we ideally want to outperform um, either existing monolingual models, if they exist, or some bilingual models. And um, at the time, this was um, the T-Systems cross-encoder, English to German, and um, a 
this low use based multilingual model. And then, of course, we also compared ourselves to the multilingual E5 base and large, um, but consider that the large model for this multilingual E5 is about three times the size of our GINA base model. And so we perform really well in general across most tasks. Um, these are all German or bilingual German tasks. On to some hybrid search. So I think you all probably know hybrid search quite well at this point if you've attended some talks at Berlin Buzzwords, but um, just to stay consistent, um, I'll tell you about uh, two different approaches. So for exact search, of course, um, this matches uh, documents that are not or that are identical to the query terms. So exact, exactly matching some keyword, um, which has the pro of having really high precision. It's unlikely to return something that doesn't have the keyword in it, and it's really fast for specific queries. And there are really good tools out there that optimize for this and have all kinds of um, yeah great boosting. And so. Um, some cons of this approach might be that it's limited to literal matches and therefore it might miss some related content, for example. But it is great to use for looking up for specific data where you don't want to have vaguely related data cropping up. Um, maybe an, almost like an exact opposite of it would be this vector search, which uses algorithms and embeddings to find similar content. And so, the pros of this would be you handle vague queries or maybe even misspelled queries, and it can handle contextual nuance as well and full sentences, and also potentially handle the intent of the query or the question quite well. And so it can find easily, easily find uh, related content and therefore have quite high recall, um, which is kind of the opposite of having really high precision, maybe. Um, some cons might be that it could return slightly less uh, relevant results, so it will always fill up your top K regardless of whether your dataset actually contains um, perfectly relevant results. But it might be really great if you have some exploratory search or you want to do some content discovery or you want to have a lot of variety in your results. So ideally, a hybrid approach can harness the strengths of both of these approaches and rule out some of the cons. So for hybrid search, we try to integrate those to, to optimize the search accuracy. Ideally, that will result in a balanced precision and recall and a high accuracy. And it also makes the search quite uh, versatile. So you can decide on your own how you want to combine scores. This might also be a con, though, because there are so many different ways to combine scores. Um, and it might be a, a little bit more complex of an implementation. But yeah, ideally, it it will be good for a dynamic search environment and a comprehensive analysis. So at this point, I'll jump into a quick demo. I indexed this e-commerce data set that we put up on Hugging Face. It's a X market data set in German and also in English data points and basically consists of uh, product titles and descriptions. And so I indexed them and I made them searchable with two different methods. And um, yeah, first method is of course just a regular BM25. It doesn't have any uh, special things on top though, no uh, like synonyms or a dictionary or anything like that, no boosting. Um, but yeah, and then a vector search as well. And then finally a hybrid search where I will also explain a little bit later how I combined these scores. But the great thing is that this implementation uses our bilingual model. So I can easily search here with an English query. And I, I did just execute the search. <laughs> but I can also um, search here with a German query, so Acrylfarbe. And we can see the BM25 returns some results. I set the top K to 20 here, but it only retrieves about um, 10 or 11 results. Sorry if this is really small, maybe I can make it a bit bigger. There we go. Yeah, so BM25 retrieves about 10 results. Of course, it's just matching exact matches at this point. Whereas the vector search can return quite a lot of results. And I've queried here in German, but it is also retrieving some English results um, somewhere. 
here, for example, is an English result. And then ideally the hybrid search can boost the things that came up in the BM25 since they are exact matches and fill up the rest of the results with relevant stuff from the vector search. But what happens when I do this little spelling mistake? So of course, I don't get any results from BM25, whereas my vector results still return something. And um, yeah, it's able to handle that quite nicely. So of course, this is a really small toy example, but I think it demonstrates quite nicely how you can use the bilingual model here in a, a hybrid search setting. So I also formulated a small kind of test case out of this X market data set. So um, the X market data, market data set has about 70,000 um, products in it, which I just also indexed and showed in that demo. Um, and I took uh, from those 70,000, 4,000 documents as queries. And I pretended that all of the documents that belong to the same, or products that uh, belong to the same category would be relevant to a query with, a, with the same category. Um, and then I implemented um, the vector search with our genome embedding bilingual model. I also used a BM25 retrieval model. And um, yeah, you can see here the MRR at 20 is 30% um, for BM25 and 51% for the vector search. And then a little bit higher even, another 2% extra using the hybrid search um, model which is great to see. So how did I combine the scores for that hybrid search? Well, this is quite a naive approach, but it kind of works. So I have a query and two search models, and from those search models, I get two sets of results. Um, these are maybe 20 results, at least in my demo, there are 20 results. And as you can see, the BM25 model here produces some non-normalized um, scores. So I feed those through a normalization, um, basically just making them all scale between zero and one so that they can be easily merged with the cosine similarity scores, which I get from the search model. And then I can apply some weighting to the different models. So I chose for the scores from BM25 to have 0 0.2 um, weighting and then the vector search to have a higher weighting, so 0 0.8. Of course, this can be adjusted and you can experiment with that. And then you might ask, well, what happens if, for example, the BM25 model doesn't retrieve documents that the uh, vector search retrieved? Um, so I interpolate those uh, missing documents by just taking the lowest scoring document from the retrieved result for a particular model. Um, so in this case, these are actually the BM25 results, and I just interpolate these two missing documents that the vector search did retrieve um, to the lowest score from that result. And then I can finally just wait and sum them up, and that's basically it. Um, of course, there are some more sophisticated methods like reciprocal rank fusion, where it doesn't really matter what the scale of your results is, and you also don't need to do any interpolation, since it, it just considers the rank of the documents. Um, yeah, you can choose these methods as you like. And quickly about how to use our embedding models in production. So the example that I just used really will not scale. It's really small. But if you have a use case where you need um, good uptime and maybe you also don't care so much for uh, hosting a model yourself because it, it does take some expertise, you can use um, a Gina, our Gina API to send your documents to, to have them encoded, um, as well as Amazon SageMaker where you can deploy our models and use them. And uh, of course, to get extra good results, you might also want to use a re-ranker, which is uh, just a more, um, yeah, a more specialized model that can re-rank your results. It's a little bit slower than an embedding model, but it will perform a really good re-ranking on your models because it is specialized to um, yeah, detect the similarity or semantic similarity between queries and documents. And so you can also use our recranker model from our API. And this point I will hand over to you, Bob. 
Thanks. And uh, now I will give a very short introduction about beyond hybrid search and when we go to multimodal embeddings. So this is a very interesting idea we brought, we have been thinking for a long time actually. So if you know, if, if you happen to use the OpenAI clip model, so clip model basically connect text and image together. So the OpenAI guys trained on 400 million image and text pairs to align the vector representation generated by the clip text tower and clip image tower. The great thing about clip, clip model is it allows us to do cross modality search. Even your images don't even have any captions. So you can use the description of the image to search the image itself. So it is really great. But the limitation of the clip model is that if um, the text tower of the clip model is a really, really weak text tower. The reason is also because of it's how clip model was trained. So clip model was trained actually using the image and the caption of image. Normally the caption of image are quite short. It's like one sentence, two sentences describing this image. So the nature of how OpenAI trained the OpenAI clip, making it a very good model for cross-modality search. So you can align two representations, but the text tower is a very weak um, retrieval model. So what we changed here is basically we uh, proposed a new training paradigm called multi-stage, multi-objective training. I will show the paper a little bit later to improve based on the OpenAI clip. So if you look at the Gina clip here, so we have like uh, this kind of matrix here. You have the query type in the, in the left, you have document type on the top, and um, the clip, the clip model, have a very weak, the text tower of clip model, if you just encode your text into using the clip text tower, you have a very weak representation, and if you search using text to text search, it will give you very bad embeddings. So if we evaluated at record five on the MTB uh, beer retrieval tasks. So the score was 0 0.162. And uh, Isabel, my colleague, just presented Gina embedding V2, which is a round score of 0 0.4 to uh, 0 0.4 to 5. The way we train our Gina clip model is basically we're trying to combine how these OpenAI guys train clip model together with how we train embedding model. So we have two objectives. One objective is to optimize text to image alignment. Another objective is to, is to optimize text to text alignment to make it a good model for both uh, cross model and text search. So if you compare with the OpenAI clip model, the Gina Clip V1 improved text-to-text -text search capability, 165%. And uh, on part of that, we also evaluated the using the text-to-search images or the, using the image to search text. It also uh, improved like 2% and 6% on top of the Clip OpenAI open Clip. And we also evaluated on the image-to-image -image search. So in some cases, you might have some content-based image retrieval. And our clip image tower also improved 10% on the recall compared to the OpenAI clip. And uh, this is a very nice thing. And uh, now you can actually build a lot of very powerful apps with the Gina clip, such as multimodal embedding search. And here I'm going to show you something. So. I actually recently happened to build my own tokenizer and I have this, this web page. And Gina and I do offer a service called Reader. If, in case you are like uh, doing like uh, web scraping and we actually offer some, something to you. So if you just prepend um, the web URL into r.gina.ai. So what I'm going to do here, what I did here is basically I added this, this page into r.gina.ai, and it will produce this web page into LLM-friendly text. So I can do quickly now refresh. It will basically read the HTML page and give you the uh, very LLM-friendly text input. And also reader support text and images. So imagine you can crawl a website, let it generate LLM-friendly text and images, then encode with Gina Clip text tower and image tower, which means you can use Gina Clip together reader to chat with the web set. This is really um, making me feel very excited. <laughs> uh, uh, how can I go, go back? Oh. 
And um, what we are doing at Gina is we are actually training a lot of different var variety of models, and uh, we are coming to release a lot of new models as well. And uh, I think in four to six weeks, we will release our Gina Embedding V3, which is our most capable embedding model targeting the OpenAI Text Embedding 3 large and um, MTB3, which means we won't overfit the MTB leaderboard to make it a good looking model but doesn't work in your search case. And we will also going to release Gina Reranker V2. Reranker V2 is basically a cross-encoder architecture, which you give the, your query, your document, it will give you re-ranked result, which you can just build on top of your elastic search and get some semantically related results. And uh, we will also re release our Gina Reranker V2 in around two to four weeks, which handles model, multilingual. Currently, our Reranker V1 only handles uh, monolingual. And um, I think in six, week, in six weeks, we will publish our Gina Clip V2. It is our most advanced multilingual and multimodal embedding model. So it will speak German, speak English, speak around 100 languages, built on top of our in-house huge data set. And we will also release our Gina Cobalt V2. Uh, by the way, Gina AI is basically the first in the industry to release a Cobalt model, which is a multi-vector search uh, solution of that model. And, uh, but the current problem of all the Cobalt model is it is built based on the MS Marco data set. And my MS Marco data set has a very bad license. The model can be only used for, uh, for research purpose. And we will, we will train and release our Gina Cobalt V2, which is fully compliant to any license. And this will serve for a very robust multi-vector search solution and working for multilingual, and which is MS Marco free. And if you want to know more about our models, and uh, we also publish a lot of papers and technical reports. So actually, we, st we started to train um, our model from Gina Embeddings V1. This is our first try in last year, around last May. And um, after, uh, I think we spent around four or five months and uh, published our Gina Embedding V1, which is our first try to catch up the mini LM and MPNet. Then we are targeting at OpenAI Text Embedding uh, V2, and we released our Gina Embedding V2, which is the first embedding model in the world open source, which can, ha can handle long context. Imagine you want to encode around eight, eight, 800 tokens, and uh, the backbone is constrained to you for 512 tokens, then it's a good chance you switch to a long context embedding model, such as Gina Embedding V2. And uh, what Isabel just presented is actually our third generation of embedding model, not really third generation, but something built on top of Gina Embedding V2, what we call bilingual embedding model. The bilingual embedding model basically takes half percent of the training data from English, half percent of the training data from German or cross-lingual, and so we train with two objectives to making sure this model works good on monolingual search tasks and also cross-lingual search tasks. So the, our German embedding model, I can very, be very confidently see that this is the top one or top two embedding model in the market you can find for German language. And uh, lastly, we, because our last week release, we also published our Gina clip, which is called your clip is also your text retriever. We're making this clip very powerful to search from four directions, text to text, text image, image to text, and image to image. And uh, that's basically uh, our presentation. We basically covered uh, bilingual, model, bilingual embedding models, training algorithm, hybrid search, and you can find our website, and you can join our Discord channel, and find our social media here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Isabel and Bo. So we have time for a few questions, if you have, yes. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, when it comes to embeddings, what use cases do you see for long context uh, lengths? Because like, the idea for me would be, if you have a really long context window and you are trying to embed this into one 
one embedding vector, like there might be different semantic concepts in, in this long text that might not, like it's difficult to capture all of that meaning in there. So um, what use cases do you see there? Okay, maybe let me answer. So basically, we did some evaluation. Even the OpenAI did some evaluation. They did uh, train their uh, release their API called OpenAI Assistant. What OpenAI is doing is they do fixed sized trunking. They trunk their document with 800 tokens, but they add a little bit of sliding window of 400 tokens. So if you imagine um, even 800 tokens, if you want to trunk your document like that, you are not capable with all the existing models on the market because they can only handle 512 tokens. So we always claim that our embedding model can handle 8,000 tokens, but we also claim that we give users the freedom to go up to 800 tokens, 8,000 tokens. Not really, you have to use 8,000 tokens. So we give you the freedom to go from one to 8,000. You can choose whatever in between. Hello, thank you for your talk. I have a question regarding uh, your opinion on using BERT as a backbone for embeddings versus like the top 10 or 20 models on MTB leaderboard which switched to autoregressive models like Mistral. So what do you think? Is it a Gina V4 is going to be like a 7 billion model? Okay, <laughs> I can, maybe, maybe let me explain again, okay. So Gina embedding v3 will be one size, uh, which is, um, uh, we, we noticed that the current MTB is like, uh, you, you can see a lot of large language models, such as 7 billion built on top of Mistral 7b. And uh, currently we are not going to that direction because uh, we think uh, a BERT bi-direction bi-directional architecture of this kind of BERT model learns better representation, also the hosting is much more easy and cheaper. But uh, we also see that uh, with our base sized model, we can hardly compare with other like uh, vendors who are providing large size or even seven billion. So now what we are training is we are training uh, something like 24 layer, which is around three times larger than our current bird based model, which is we call Gina Embedding V3. So it will be three times larger than our current model, and um, this will be our new backbone. And uh, actually, we already started to plan the next generation of Gina Embedding V4, and uh, we will gradually scale our backbone to below three billion parameters. That's what we are doing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, just checking online. I don't see any online question. Maybe one question at the back. Uh, here. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, just uh, curious, uh, what is the reason behind building a model that tries to uh, outperform in various tasks as opposed to uh, building models that are optimized for each of the tasks separately. Okay, <laughs> maybe let me answer again. So we want to train um, uh, our objective, initial objective is to train a general embedding model. So this general embedding model we aim at working on a lot of different tasks. But I also understand the current audience in this room, they might be mostly interested in the retrieval tasks. But actually there are a lot of people using our model, for example, to do duplicate detection. For example, you submit a question on Quora and so someone and try to detect whether this question has been asked. Some people we know are doing um, classification on top, of, on top of embeddings. We know some, some people are just classify if the sentiment is good or not. So we really want to train a good embedding model on top of different tasks to, because we really want to learn a best representation. And I, on the other hand, I also noticed your problem of specialized embedding models. And this is actually what we are doing for Gina Embedding V3. So our Gina Embedding V3 will have a general backbone, which is the 
trained using the pairs model. Then actually afterwards, we will have something called lower fine-tuned heads for each downstream task. So there will be a lower fine-tuned heads for retrieval, lower fine-tuned heads for, let's say, clustering. So it will be much more performant than the current model on different downstream tasks. Thanks. OK. Uh, I saw that you are labeling this model as MTB-free. Uh, it's the first time I, I see that term. And I'm, I'm really happy that uh, that's where you're moving. But what do you think, in general, is there going to be a new scoreboard with MTB-free or actual, you know, this actually works? or such companies or a different, uh, more realistic uh, benchmark has been produced. Uh, what do you see the direction of um, yeah, the benchmarks in general going? So Bo just um, actually was part of producing a good new benchmark. So I will answer, let him answer this question as well. <laughs> OK, actually. Um, I was very lucky to work with, maybe you have heard of BGE embedding model and BAI. They published something called BGE M3 and BGE 1.5. They also released three rankers. Actually, Gina AI and BGE, the BAI team, we have been collaborating for around half a year. And we just published a new benchmark, which is called AirBench, which is on Hugging Face as well, supported by Hugging Face guys. Since this AirBench, we, what we are doing is we are, giving a corpus. Every time, we are dynamically creating questions and answers using large language models. So this is like MTB, but all the content is dynamic. So after three or six months, we will completely refresh the entire benchmark with the new data set to evaluate. So this benchmark will have some more fair uh, comparison against embedding models. That's what we are doing. OK. Thank you. Thanks very much for detailed answers. We can uh, give them uh, an applause. And uh, thank you. Thank you again.